Do you want to know how to pass God's tests? The first point is this, don't be surprised. Now you'd be thinking, what does that mean? Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised because many of us fail God's tests because we don't expect them. We expect everything to be easy in life. We expect challenges to only come from the devil. But there are times when God will challenge you, give you challenging instructions, put you in challenging circumstances, and he'll see how you respond. Even when people treat you badly, he'll test your heart. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17 God, that God examines, God says, I, the Lord, examine the heart. I, I examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each one according to his ways. So our ways will determine what we obtain from God. And that ways are manifested in the way we go through a test. So there are tests coming in life. And we pass those tests by not being surprised, by expecting to be tested, and by responding appropriately in the test. How do you pass the test? Seven powerful points to pass the test from God. Shalom. There are many things that happen in our lives that we may not understand and in some cases may find unexpected or in other cases may find undeserved. And there are many challenging situations, challenging circumstances that we encounter as we make our way through life. We know this, life is a journey and many stops along the way, many encounters along the way and these things can often have an impact on our lives that we are not quite expecting. But do you realize, uh, beloved, that many of these situations, many of these encounters are actually a test from God? And there are situations that God will provoke to test us, instructions that he will give to test us, but also our response to trials will be a test. We've been talking about divine testing, how God tests us, the fact that God does test his people. In the last um, episode, we talked about why we go through these tests. Because one of the things we need to understand is the fact that our existence is not is simply a matter of going to work, coming home, eating, sleeping, having children, raising them, and dying. And many people live like that, as if life was just a process of struggling to get through whatever circumstances you face, and then getting blessings and blessings and blessings from God to make life here bearable until they go to heaven. But that is not God's idea of what the human life consists of. And we talked at length about why he tests us, because he's, he's equipping us to do and be certain things while we are on this earth and also in eternity. And today we'll be looking at how to pass God's test. How to pass God's test. This is absolutely essential. And I'm Pastor Bola Ogenigui from Paris, France. This is Passion for God. And if you're ever in our beautiful city of Paris, do stop by. Send us an email. Come and see us in church. So we're talking about how to pass God's test. Uh, if you've been following this series, you know that tests are an essential in the Christian life. They are a prerequisite to promotion, to advancement, to being useful to God in the work of the kingdom and in the life of the kingdom. And so if tests are essential, how do we pass them? Let's look again at our text that we've been working with throughout this series, which will be ending now. And it's Genesis chapter 22, when God goes to Abraham. Listen to the way it is defined, it is described. After these things, God tested Abraham. You know, there's, there are no two ways about it. You can't think maybe it wasn't quite a test. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and then Abraham responded, and we know the story. He calls him to offer him his only son, and he specifies only son. And that's something we would have thought, what kind of instruction is this? You know, but as we've seen, tests can be challenging instructions, difficult instructions that we have to comply with. And this is very important for us to understand because many believers today in our age think that God is only there to make them feel comfortable and that he'll never tell them something that makes them uncomfortable. He will. And the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17 that God, you know, he says, I, the Lord, examine the mind, I test the heart. 
And he says that he tests the heart because he wants to, because he's going to recompense everyone, give to everyone according to his ways. So we understand that one of the reasons why God tests us is to release things into our lives and determine whether or not we actually deserve to get those things at that time. I'm not talking about salvation because many people get hot and bothered every time you talk about meriting or deserving anything. Uh, and they think, oh, it's all by grace. Your salvation is entirely by grace. But do you know that if you're married to that beautiful woman today, you may not be the most wonderful person in town, but you've done something. You did something that touched her heart and made her want to have you. In, in our work with God, there are things that would not come to us if we do not demonstrate to God that we are able to handle them and that we are willing to do them and that we have learned the lessons we were meant to learn in life to qualify us for that level. Otherwise, God would be a totally permissive father and he really we, we would not even approve of him as a father if there were no terms and if we did not have to prove anything. We don't have to prove anything to be saved or to be loved, but we have to prove something to move on to the next level, to advance, to, to receive promotion, to be entrusted with important things. And so he wanted to, he says, that I, test, um, I test the hearts of men. We, we also see in um, Proverbs 17 that he he is called the tester of men, the tester of hearts. Isn't that amazing? So how do we pass these tests if we know that they are inevitable? One of the ways to pass the test, I'm giving you today seven ways to pass divine tests. The first way to pass a test is to expect it. Now that's very profound. Let me read to you in First Peter chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised. I could just tell you the first way to pass a test is don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at what? When the test, when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you, as if something unusual were happening to you, instead rejoice as you share in the sufferings of the Messiah, so that you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory. Now this, these people are going to go through persecution. That may not be your case. That Your case may be a challenging instruction. They're going to go through persecution. He calls it a fiery ordeal. And he says, look, it's only coming to test you. So don't be surprised. Now if you're not to be surprised at a fiery ordeal, why should you be surprised at a challenging instruction? Why should you be surprised when God requires you to do something? that you really would not like to do. Why should you be surprised when something happens and he says, no, I require you to forgive that person. I require you not only to forgive them, but to bless them. He's testing your obedience. And well, no, the longer he says, no, I don't want it. The quality did to me. The longer it's going to take to come into the place of harmony with God and to pass the test. So the first thing is don't be surprised. Expect it. Expect that you will be tested and try to look at life circumstances in the light of divine testing before rejecting something outright and, and before going crazy and before, uh, you know, losing it and, and throwing a tantrum and uh, turning the, the, your back on those people before walking out of your church because they would not give you the, uh, the opportunity to do the things you think you were gifted to do and you're called to do. Hey, Maybe it's a test. Maybe God is testing your character. Maybe he's saying, I have gifted this person, but do they have a character? Uh, and, and we know that one of the reasons why God tests us is to show ourselves, show us what is in us, uh, to reveal our real motives. Because if my motive is to serve, does it matter where I serve necessarily? If God wants me there, will he not ensure that I get there? Should I cause all this trouble just because I want to prove that I am qualified and I am called? If I am called, I'm called, first of all, to peace. I'm called to love. I'm called to service before I'm called to sing. And so those fundamentals of the Christian life must be in place before we decide to exert our right, exercise our right to the other aspects of our calling, the calling to be holy, the calling to be pure, the calling to be kind, the calling to be generous must prevail over the calling to preach or the calling to sing. And if we don't see that, and God is going to test us. To, so that we can know who we really are. Because sometimes we think we're this amazing person who's gifted in all of these things and all these horrible people. They, they, they are souls. They're afraid of me because I'm a David. You know, we have all these ideas about people that are really not right. And we don't see what's in us. And sometimes these tests will reveal what's in us. And so don't be surprised. So when you get um, that backlash, don't be surprised. Uh, when, you, when you're rejected, you think you should have been picked as the next person and they turn you down. Don't be surprised. If it could be a test or you go through this very difficult place. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. That is, that's the first way that we pass a test because if we're not surprised, 
I, I, I don't mean don't be surprised in the sense of hmm, my enemies are at it again. You know, we have that thing. Hmm, my enemies are at it again. I'm not surprised. I knew they would do this. No, that's not the attitude. It's like, oh, maybe the Lord is testing my heart. I need to be very careful. And, and, oh, these things are happening. Okay, the Lord said, you know, there will be tests. And so I'm ready, and I'm going to keep praying. I'll stay in faith. I'll believe God, and I'll walk through this uh, with joy and with faith. And perhaps that's really the most important part of all that I'm going to say to you today. Do not be surprised. It's the fact of being caught off guard that makes us mi misinterpret things that we're experiencing. And with the help of our very carnal friends, we just step out of the will of God while celebrating Jesus. No, we sing hallelujah, the Lord is good while we are walking out of the will of God because we did not expect the test to happen. And we think that because these things are happening, it must be because people hate us or the devil is after us or that God, God must be on our side. But God is really on his side. When you get to know the Lord, you know that there's only one side for God. It's not your side. He's on his side. And the only thing that matters is that you be on God's side. And if you're on God's side, then he will be on your side. But God won't ch change sides to please you. He will not become carnal to make you happy. And so it's very important for us. I like that he will not become carnal to make you happy. Uh, it's very important for us to understand that the second way that we pass divine tests, this is very important, is wisdom. Wisdom. We need great wisdom. In fact, I believe that we need more wisdom than most people realize. You need more wisdom to navigate the the, 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 the issues of life that most of us realize and we have destroyed things and destroyed vital relationships and we have shut the door in our own faces. We have trampled precious things underfoot because we lacked wisdom. We need great wisdom to navigate through life. When I was a young woman, I remember my sister and I, we, the Lord has always given us, has given us this gift of wisdom. And we've been, we've been growing and I need more still. I need more still. Uh, but, you know, we, we always used to look at older people and it was so crystal clear to us the things they were doing wrong. We used to think, but why are they doing that? Isn't it clear to them that they shouldn't be doing that? And then we grew older and we realized that actually older people are not necessarily wise. Wisdom is a grace. It's a marvelous gift of God. So I want to encourage you to pray for wisdom. And then later, of course, when I became involved in church and then went into ministry, I was astonished at how little wisdom parents had in dealing with their children. And I just thought, why don't they have more wisdom? And, and, and of course, when you see that, you begin to look at yourself as well and begin to pray that, Lord, you know, give me more wisdom myself. I need more wisdom. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10 says this. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen its edge, then one must exert more strength. However, the advantage of wisdom is that it brings success. See, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen its edge, then one must exert more strength. See, that's the case of people who lack wisdom. They struggle a lot through things that really should not require so much struggling. And then they, they are always forcing things and trying to push things. And whereas there is a wiser way of doing things. Sometimes I see people in the ministry and they deploy a lot of energy to do very little, very, very little, because there is no wisdom. And when challenges come and tests come in people's lives, they just, you know, go, all out and you see the way they are handling things but why are you doing that because we don't have wisdom we need great wisdom to pass the test of life we need great wisdom to pass the test of life and we also need great humility that's the third point humility why do i say we need humility because you see god doesn't owe us anything he's our boss in a sense some people may not like that because they just don't think he's my daddy he is but he's also a king and you're also working for him he's your boss he's your leader and so we need to understand that we must submit wholly to his authority the humility to be fully submitted to him and accept whatever comes from him many people fail divine tests because they spend the whole time 
arguing with God. They spend the whole time rebelling against him. They spend their time complaining because they just don't see why should God and why should God and why should you put me through this? Am I? See, that is so childish and stupid. It's not worthy of a child of God. We are quite a measure of maturity whereby when we're going through the tests of life and we know that this is the Lord testing us and this is, this is a test. Wisdom, oh, this is a t- wisdom to know it's a test. That's that, that, sorry, that's right wisdom to know it's a test and secondly wisdom to navigate wisdom to know what to do to pass the test wisdom to submit and so humility is an expression of wisdom humility demonstrates that we are wise enough to know that we really cannot do anything against God and that we are at his mercy. We are totally at his mercy. Even those who don't believe in him are at his mercy. We don't really see that way, but it's the absolute truth. And if the Lord were to remove his favor from your life, you would die. God has a way of making your life perfectly miserable and useless if he were to choose to. We are grateful that that is not his character. The other person behaves that way, but that is not his character. That is not his his way. But so we must have the humility to submit to him, to submit to his test, to submit to his ways and to submit to whatever requirement he imposes on us to pass the test. Now, listen to this. Abraham could have said, no way, you are not having my son. Let me remind you that you called me out of my land and brought me here. Or perhaps you have forgotten. May I refresh your memory? You told me to get rid of my other son. You told me to let him and his mother go away. You rem- may, I, may I again refresh your memory, dear divinity, that you are the very one who said that this child shall be the child of promise. So, um, no, I will not do it. Mm -mm, I will not do it. Do you know, that may sound funny to some of you, but we do that all the time. There are so many issues of life where we are not humble enough to accept the direction that the Lord is giving. Sometimes we can only pass the test through humility because what we are required to do will require great humility. Oh, great humility. And then we We don't want to do it. There are times when people will call people to do something, pull them out on something that is successful and huge, or some offer comes that's successful and that would make them successful and and will cause them to just blow up, as we say. And then God says, no, you rather to go and do this one here. And they think, me? What? Jesus, you know, it's like, excuse me, (laughs) me? And we think, me? But do you know who I am? And, and, and we, don't, we don't want to do those things because we're not humble. And, and great humility is required because God will test your humility. He will test you because he doesn't need any competitors. I always say to the Lord, I'm not going to make any competition to you. You may think oh, you can't make any competition to God anyway. But you see, when God begins to use you powerfully, there are times when people will celebrate you to the point where you begin to think, if only for me. <laughs> if not for me, rather. And so they, it's imperative that we show the Lord that we are under his authority. And so humility is the third way by which we pass divine tests. Let me give you the fourth point. The fourth point is this, and I knew you were expecting it, faith, 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 faith. We must trust him. That is how Abraham passed this particular test. You know, (laughs) Abraham, when he was asked, he said, the Lord will provide the ram. We are going to worship and we will come back. Now, some people think he only said that just to find something to say, but I believe that he actually believed it because the Bible tells us, listen to Hebrews 11 verse 17, that by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, referring to this passage here in Genesis 22, that God tested Abraham and asked him for his only son. It says here in Hebrews 11 uh, verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises and he was offering his unique son, the one it had been said about, your seed will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. And as an illustration, he received him back. So his thinking was this, God can raise him from the dead. And so he said, no, we're going to go. We will go. I will obey. I trust God. He'll bring him back. And he said, no, we're going to go. God will supply. And we're going to go and worship him. And that's what he did. He believed God. He trusted. 
trusted him. You know, it's so encouraging to read these things because you, you know the story of Abraham. He didn't start out with uh, extraordinary faith. He had enough faith to obey and to leave his country. But when it came to having a child, at some point, his faith sort of weakened at a point. But then his faith went back again because the Bible tells us that he did not weaken in faith. So it means that he, 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 he regained that capacity to trust God. And we need that if we are going to pass divine tests because things don't always look good. You can go for years in a particular situation and you just wish God would intervene and change things. Yet you know he's testing you. You're being tested. Your perseverance is being tested. Your endurance is being tested. Your faith is being tested. Will you trust God? Will you believe him? Will you continue even if you don't see it? You could be pastoring a church somewhere and it's really challenging. And the people you started with in ministry are now a mega church in the thing and they, they have branches all over the place and they're now being called bishop or apostle or, or, or those very beautiful expressions of our greatness that we ministers of the gospel so love to adorn ourselves with and and you are just humble pastor because I mean no one would call you bishop you can be bishop about 30 people or, some people are, or, or and, and they certainly wouldn't call you apostle whatever you know and some even call you brother and you, you you're still there with uh, uh, 30 people who come and go and um, and, and, and this after, you know, 20 years. And you just feel that, what is going on here? And you thought, Lord, if I could just be in that location where my friends are, I too would be shining, you know, because your word says, arise, shine, for your light has come. But then the Lord sends you to a place where it's much more challenging. And, and you are thinking, maybe I should stop, maybe I should, no, it's a test. Because he did, not, he did not send you there to kill you. One of the things I know without a shadow of a doubt, and this is something that has helped me go through many, many tests in my life, is the assurance that God is for me and that he, he does not intend to kill me. He does not intend to destroy my life. He's not a destroyer of men. He's a maker of men. He's not a, you know, he, he doesn't call you to ministry so that he can wreck your life. You know, he doesn't call you to ministry so that he, he can make a mess of your life. And many people think that when you answer the call and you do things they didn't expect you to, do they think they're making a mess of their lives they're thinking we're going to see where all that we end be that's because they don't reckon with the greatness of the god who called you and i want to encourage someone today you're in that place and it's been a long time and you're thinking lord what is going on it's a test it's a test because what is going to come out of this is going to be amazing and when you're when, when it's coming out you you will sit back dumbfounded and you look around and say is there someone else here that god is blessing like this i mean is all this for me because God is not a destroyer of men. He's not a killer of men. He doesn't call you to cause your life to be a wreck and a mess. He doesn't call you to destroy you, to make a mess of your existence. He calls you so that you can be a blessing in your generation. The fifth point that I will give you, and this, this, this tallies with the point on humility, is this. And I need to go very quickly through the outcome of divine testing. If we cannot take any, everything in the program shown on television, you can watch everything on our YouTube channel. Listen to this. The fifth point is this. Very closely linked to humility. Submission. Submission to the sovereignty of God. This is a very important point, and it's particularly important for us people who walk by faith. Faith is not in opposition to the sovereignty of God, and that is why knowing the will of the Father is extremely important. We know things that are not the will of God. It is not the will of God for you to die sick. It is not the will of God for you to be hindered by infirmity such that you cannot actually do his will. Do you see that? Uh, and there's certain things in our lives that we people who are not faith inclined, if I may say so, would accept as the sovereignty of God. And on the other hand, there are other things that relate to the sovereignty of God that faith people don't want to accept as the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign, beloved. There are many things that we fight that are actually part of God's sovereign plan for us. And I'm not talking about any form of evil. I'm just talking about things that may be challenging, that may not be part of your uh, plan for your life, uh, sending you to go and live in a particular place, to go and work in a particular place. He's sovereign. He has the right to do that. He can dispose of your existence. You know, I had this experience once that I share a lot when I talk about things like this. I was in Brazil, and that's when I was learning Portuguese. 
and um, I was in a course there. I would go to class in the mornings and come back in the afternoon. And for the first week, now I was in Brazil for a month. I was in Bahia, Salvador da Bahia, and I wanted to go out and walk the streets and talk to people uh, and, and just drink in the culture. So I was very interested from an anthropological and cultural point of view to discover the place and to discover the people. But I got there and for the first week I couldn't do anything but go to class in the morning, go back home, lie down on my couch and pray, pray all afternoon, pray all afternoon because the hand of the Lord was upon me. And at one point the Lord gave me this revelation and I saw myself. It was as if the Lord was holding me, almost like a, a, a very thin thread holding my life. And I realized that that was God holding me and that really... I, I saw how dependent my life was on his goodwill. And that if you were to decide to drop that thread, I was gone. I was finished. These things are very difficult to explain. But you have an experience like that and you see yourself in a state of absolute and completely dependence upon an, upon the, this, this divine being. And you realize that you really have been extremely cocky and arrogant for the, for, for most of your life, thinking that you controlled anything. You could decide anything on your own for your life and you you could decide on outcomes without consulting this divine being who holds the reins to your existence and who can hold you up with a thread and drop you and you're finished. And it, it was so powerful. It changed me forever. It brought home to me the concept of the sovereignty of God, of submission to the will of God and of being in harmony with God and realizing that uh, Father, I owe you. You don't owe me anything. And so, beloved, submission to the sovereignty of God is extremely important because it enables us to accept his test, to humble ourselves, to release our faith, and to just have a good attitude throughout the time when we're being tested, to just believe God, trust him, be humble, be submissive, be, 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 just be, be small in our own eyes and just, just, yes, Lord. Okay, Lord. Will you want me to do that? Yes, Lord. Shall I do that? Yes, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. You want me to trust you for that? Yes, Lord. I trust you for that. Shall I do this? I'll do it, Lord. Okay. I should forgive them. I forgive them, Lord. Whatever, Lord, whatever you say. And this ties in with the last point. Oh, the sixth point. There's still the last point. The sixth point is this to accept to have the spirit of obedience. We, we pass tests by being obedient. Uh, and you know, all of these things are connected. We pass tests by being obedient, by doing whatever we are told to do. Abraham obeyed God and he obeyed promptly. And the very next day he, he moved up. And you know, God really liked the fact that Abraham obeyed him. He, and he said it. And I'm going to read that to you because I think that we don't have time now to look at the outcome of divine testing. But let me just um, finish with the final point. The final point is this, to accept the process. Whatever process you have to go through in the test, accept it. If it's cleansing, accept it. If it's repentance, accept it. If it's endurance, accept it. If it's waiting, accept it. Whatever process, we accept the process. Now, one final point. What is the outcome of divine testing? The outcome of divine testing is blessing. Let me read this to you, what God said to Abraham. And that's a beautiful way of ending this series. The outcome of divine testing is blessing. Genesis 22, verse 16. By myself I have sworn, this is the Lord's declaration. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, I will indeed bless you and make your offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring will possess the gates of your enemies. Let me read you a passage from Matthew. We mentioned this woman earlier on in this series. Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus replied to her, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was cured because she accepted the test. Jesus tested her when he refused to heal her daughter. Oh, the dogs. And she replied, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She was tested and he said, oh, your faith is great. And because of that, I pray that that will be the Lord's testimony concerning you, that you will come out of whatever test you're in right now, or that you will be in at any point in your life with the Lord saying to you, your faith is great. And God said to Abraham, because you have done this thing, not because I had promised it before, but because you had have passed my test. I pray that you will pass all the tests 
Whatever comes up in life, you will know when it's a test. You will have the right attitude. You will have the right position. And the Lord will be able to bless you. Remember that. God said to Abraham, because you have done this thing. So the blessing is confirmed and actualized when we pass the test. So what happens when you have passed the test? What happens when you have passed the test? If God decides that you have passed the test, what then do you get for passing the test? The first point is this divine blessing, divine blessing, the blessing that we seek through prayer in many instances will only come when we have passed a test. Now, if you don't know anything about divine testing, you can watch the entire series that I have done on the test of God, how, how God tests us, why God tests us, how to pass a test and the outcome of passing a test. And I'll tell you this, when you pass a test, there is blessing. That's what God said to Abraham. He said, because you have done this, I will bless you. You see, God had promised to bless Abraham, but he didn't step into those blessings really. The blessings were not confirmed until he did something. And when he did that, there was a response immediately from God. God, the Bible says God tested Abraham and Abraham passed the test. And then the Lord said to him, he says, by myself, I have sworn. This is the Lord's declaration because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son. I will indeed bless you. I will indeed bless you. What happens when we pass divine tests? Perseverance and increased faith. That's what we get from James. What do we get? What, what happens when we pass a test? Divine exploits, greater honor from God, more greed, more empowerment, more spiritual strength. Beloved, I want to encourage you. Pass the tests. Pass the tests. And if you don't know anything about passing divine tests, as I said earlier, Go and watch the entire series. It will equip you to recognize the test and to have the wisdom to go through the test, pass the test and receive the blessing that comes from passing the test because you will face the test. God bless you. Shalom. I pray for you that the word of God will come alive in your heart. I pray for you that zeal for his house will consume you. I pray for you. God built into me such a passion for his person. It's one of the greatest gifts that I have received from heaven. And it's one of the major things that people say, wow, you're so passionate. I don't try to be passionate, but I cannot read this book. I don't get excited about Jesus.